My name is Zane. And my name is Andreas. Today, me and my family will read from Mark chapter 5, verse 21 to verse 42. Jesus got into the boat again and went, went back to the other side of the lake where a large crowd gathered around him on the shore. Then a leader of the synagogue named Jairus arrived when he saw Jesus. He fell at his feet pleading with him. My little daughter is dying, he said. Please come and put, um, lay your hands on her. Heal her. Heal her so she can live. Jesus went with him and all the people followed, crowding around him. A woman in the crowd had suffered for, for 12 years with constant bleeding. She had suffered a great deal from many doctors, and over the years, she had spent everything she had to pay them, but she had gotten no better. In fact, she gotten worse. She had heard about Jesus, so she came up behind him through the crowd and touched his robe. For she thought to herself, if I can just touch his robe, I will be healed. Immediately, the bleeding stopped and she could feel in her body that she had been healed of this terrible condition. Jesus realized at once that healing power had gone out from him. So he turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my robe? The disciples said to him, look at the crowd pressing around you. How can you ask who touched me? But he kept on looking around to see who had done it. Then the frightened woman, trembling, at the realisation of what had happened to her, came and fell to her knees in front of him and told him what she had done. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Your suffering is over. While he was still speaking to her, messengers arrived from the house of Jairus. The leader of the synagogue, they then told him, your daughter is dead. There is no use troubling the daughter. The teacher. The teacher now. But um, Jesus overheard them and said to Jairus, don't be afraid, just have faith. Then Jesus stopped the crowd and wouldn't let anyone go with him except Peter, James and John, the brother of James. When they came to the house of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw much commotion and weeping and wailing. He went inside and asked, why, are all, this, why all this commotion and weeping? The child isn't dead, she's only asleep. The crowd laughed at him, but he made them leave, and he took the girl's father and mother and his three disciples into the room where the girl was lying. Holding her hand, he said to her, Ta Ta Talita Como, which means, little girl, get up. And the girl who was 12 years old immediately stood up and walked around. They were overwhelmed and totally amazed. Let us pray. Dear Father, thank you that we can be together this morning. We want to pray that you will bless Jodie whilst she brings us the word and that you will open our hearts. Amen. Wasn't that fantastic? Brilliant job there, uh, Van Yarsveld. Now I'm hoping behind me on the screen, we should be able to see Jodie in Zambia. There she is, ready to go. So I'm now going to hand over to Jody, who's bringing our preach from Zambia. So over to Jody. Good morning and greetings from Zambia. Um, I've been here since the middle of October-ish and I'm here with my other hat on, which is my Beyond Ourselves hat. And since I've been here, we've been meeting with every child at the partner schools we have here 
and just seeing how they're doing and catching up with them. Uh, we've also been doing some refresher trainings in our, with our Jolly Phonics Literacy Programme. And also, big news, while I've been here, uh, we've had the final yes, the final green light from the key person uh, for our rollout of this literacy programme across the province next year, which has been an amazing answer to prayer. So really thankful to be here for that. Uh, we've also been doing some trainings with our grade sevens and also our grade fives and six for our grade sevens. Our team have been uh, journeying them through the transition from primary to secondary. And then for our fives and sixes, just speaking into their lives, talking about their value and their identity and their belonging and their purpose in God and putting that and instilling that in them and how that um, really goes deep in their foundations of who they are and the choices they make. And so it's been great to be here. I'll be back in the UK next weekend, uh, ready for my two-week self-isolation, which I should emerge from at the same time as lockdown, hopefully. And so I'm looking forward to seeing lots of you after that. But this morning we're on our final Sunday of the Jesus Way series. And this series we've been looking at how do we live life the Jesus way? How do we deal with things that get thrown at us um, the Jesus way? What does that mean? And we started the series, if you can remember all those weeks ago, with those familiar verses, an invitation from Jesus, where he says, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And if you can remember back then, we talked about this secret of the easy yoke and what the yoke meant. And there's a fly there for you, this is real. <laughs> and like every rabbi in his day, Jesus had a yoke and he wasn't a farmer, he didn't have an actual yoke, he was a teacher. And if you remember, we talked about how every rabbi had this yoke, which was their interpretation of the Torah, of the scriptures of the day. But it was more about, more than just about their interpretation, it's about how they lived their lives. And so if someone was following a, a, a rabbi, they wouldn't just follow their, their knowledge and know, understand their knowledge, but they'd follow their set of teachings and how to live life. And so to be a follower of Jesus and a disciple of Jesus and it's to take up this invitation is to follow Jesus, be an apprentice of him and live life the Jesus way. Follow his teaching and live life his way. And that's what we've been talking about. And it's, it could be simply put in under three goals and organized into three goals to, to be with Jesus, to become like Jesus and do what he would do if he were you. That's living the Jesus way. And it's interesting, I've been um, doing a lot of reading over this year, unsurprisingly, we've had a bit more time, some of us. Um, but John Mark Comer thinks that perhaps we've lost our way a bit. And he says this, he says, the Western church has lost sight of the fact that the way of Jesus is just that, a way of life. It's not just a set of ideas, what we call theology, or a list of do's and don'ts, what we call ethics. I mean, it is that, but it's so much more. It's a way of life based on that of Jesus himself, a lifestyle. A lifestyle, like the way a person lives. And over this series, we've looked at how Jesus lived and how to deal with our fear and our grief and our history and our sin and our sickness, the Jesus way, in the lifestyle of Jesus. And we've seen that it's not just ideas, it's not just a list of do's and don'ts, but it's actual way to live life and deal with the things we're facing. And I know there have been meaningful and significant encounters for many people during this series, particularly as we looked at fear and as we looked at grief and sickness. And I just want to say thank you, Jesus, for, for his teaching and for leading us in his way. And, and thanks to everybody for, for just being having hearts open to say yes to Jesus and to be vulnerable before him so that he can bring healing and freedom into our lives. And so today we're finishing the series with dealing with time pressure or hurry or busyness, the Jesus way. And you might think that's an odd one to end on, but hopefully by the end of this morning, you'll see why it's so important and so significant for us to look at and understand. And so when I say hurry, I mean to, to move or act quickly. And again, maybe it's strange to be thinking of that during a second lockdown, when we're hardly moving at all, uh, and certainly not quickly or at a hurried pace. And yet, 
I think we have an opportunity in this second lockdown because in the first lockdown, I don't know about you, but I noticed that we had an opportunity, a real gift given to us if we chose to see it that way, to, to slow down and to stop and to look at our priorities and to, to look at what we're doing and, and make choices about what we would start up again when the world started to open up again. And I think we have that option and that opportunity to do that again now. And I know this, is, this year's gone on. I know the prolonged lockdowns and restrictions are painful for many of us and I'm not denying the toughness of that. And I hear it and I feel it and I know it. But I wanna say, I think there's opportunity in this time too, to face this moment, these weeks, the Jesus way, in the way that Jesus would do it, to be with Jesus, to become like him and do what he would do in this moment, in this season. So that when our lives open up again, we don't rush back to what we had and we don't have the same priorities and values that we had and come under the same pressure we had. Because hurry is a problem because hurry and pressure impact us, not just our physical well-being and our, our mental well-being and our emotional well-being, but our spiritual well-being too. And Dallas Willard said this, he said, hurry is the great enemy of spiritual life in our day. Ruthlessly eliminate it from your life. Now, I don't know about you, but if I was asked what's the greatest enemy to our spiritual life in this day, I'm not sure I would say hurry. I'm not sure I'd even think of it. It would be way down the list. There are other things that would come to mind first, like, like sin, like grief, like loss, uh, like uh, fear, and, or just the, the culture we live in. And I just am surprised when I read that. But actually, it makes sense. Our society has got busier and busier. And how often do you hear the comment when you say, how are you doing? Oh, I'm busy. Like it's become some kind of status symbol. Like the busier we are, the more important we are. That that's our priority. So we, we work more, we connect more, uh, we exercise more, we shop more, everything's more. And some of those things in and of themselves, working hard and all that, isn't necessarily a bad thing, but it can take its toll if it becomes our priority. And we often equate free time with a lack of success rather than it being a positive thing. And psychologists, this is fascinating to me, psychologists have actually identified um, that we now can suffer from something called hurry sickness. So just listen to, to this description. It's defined as a behavior, um, a pattern characterized by continual rushing, anxiousness, uncomfortable feeling when you feel short of time, and so you tend to perform every task faster and get more flustered and, and get very frustrated when there's any kind of delay or interruption. Is this sounding familiar at all? In case you're interested and you want to hear more, symptoms for hurry sickness include moving from one checkout line to another. Hmm, because it looks shorter and faster. I'm just going to leave that with you. Uh, maybe counting the cars in front of you at the line, um, at the traffic lights or at the roundabout or over here at the tolls and choosing the line that you think is going to go quicker and getting in the lane that's going fastest on the motorway or maybe multitasking to the point of forgetting what the actual tasks are. And if anyone dares interrupt you, man, the irritability and that we kind of focus especially on those who are close to us and the restlessness we have when we can't seem to slow down or relax and working habits that mean we don't know when to stop and just this out of order priorities and the list goes on and on and so we do things that try to distract us because we don't know what else to do so we binge watch tv box sets netflix we overeat we mindlessly surf the internet and go on our phones is any of this sounding familiar? It can't just be me that has a little bit of a jarring moment when I read those symptoms. And on that surfing the internet and on your phone, did you know the average person touches their phone 2,617 times a day? So assuming we're getting eight hours sleep, that's just over 163 times an hour we're touching our phones just to distract us and busy, 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 hurry, 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 pressure, pressure, pressure to respond, reply, know what's going on, information. And as I read uh, this book earlier in the year, John Mark Comer, The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry, I was really struck by something that maybe hurry 
was the issue that was under all the other issues that I and, and other people experienced. Maybe you. Maybe the issues in my heart that, that some of us have, the, the low level of anxiety all the time. The anger that leaks out. The lack of life. Not, not being present to God or to other people in our lives. The, the breakdown in our own growth and maturity. And maybe hurry had a lot to answer for. For being more anxious, exhausted, on the edge, not handling interruptions well, not being present to, to my body or the moment, and certainly not loving and joyful and peaceful the majority of the time. So I realised I had a choice to make, which road I was going to take, which way. And I'm not saying I have it all together um, yet. I'm on the journey, but I do feel like I'm on the way back to, to freedom, to healing, to love. And I think one of the greatest challenges has been to, to unhurry, to slow down, especially in our culture, especially with smartphones. And the lockdown has actually been a real gift in that. But hurry is the problem, is a problem. John Ortberg says, hurry isn't just a sign of a disordered schedule, it's the sign of a disordered heart. It's not just the sign of a disordered schedule, it's the sign of a disordered heart. And sometimes we make ourselves busy and allow pressure to take over because there's a deeper pain that we're running from and we don't just want to sit in the moment and live life in the moment with all its goodness, but also with all its pain. Or it might just be that our priorities are totally out of line and it's disordered. It's not in a kingdom order. It's not in a God order. It's not a Jesus way order. Kingdoms have cultures and a DNA. The UK has a culture. Uh, Zambia here has a culture. And Jesus's kingdom has a culture as well. And we often focus, when we, when we look at the word, when we look at um, our scripture passages, we often focus at what Jesus says about what his words mean and what he's saying to other people about himself and about us and about the state of the world and how we can be reconciled to God. And Jesus' words are really important. But this morning, I don't want to look at Jesus' words. I actually want to look around his words at the culture and the pace and the way that he is in this passage. So thank you to Hildegard and Bernard and family for reading the passage this morning. And there is so much in there that we could look at about Jesus's words and study and there's a richness there. And I encourage you some other day, maybe we'll do that, but go do that yourselves. Look at how Jesus is um, with his words in this passage. But today I want to look at his culture, his pace and his, the way he did it, the way he did life. So Mark 5, 27 to 28, we have this key verse where it says, When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak, because she thought, if I could just touch his clothes, I'll be healed. So let's just imagine the scene for a moment. The disciples are there, Jesus is there, sweat's trickling down their back, not dissimilar to mine right now. Sorry, too much information. It's hot here. Um, but can you imagine the scene? The, the crowds are pressing in. Uh, Jesus is on his way somewhere. But then this guy, Jairus, who's a synagogue leader, an important man that immediately adds pressure, an important man comes to him and says, you've got to come to my house. My daughter is dying. You've got to come. And so Jesus is, starts to slowly make his way with the crowds and I'm sure this father is going just get out of his way let him get to my house and then as he's inching along he feels someone touch him not just touch him but touch him intentionally for his power and Jesus knows that and he stops there's a dying girl down the road and he stops and he has a moment with this woman he recognises her faith he takes time to speak to her, for her to be healed, for her to, to be encouraged and dignified. He calls her daughter. And he has that moment. And can you imagine the father kind of wringing his hands? His daughter's dying. And Jesus has stopped for this woman, this unclean, not whole woman. 
and he's taking the time to speak to her and, and inspire her and heal her. And then as that's kind of coming to an end, the messengers come and say, it's too late. The daughter's dead. Can you imagine that father? He's, he's probably spent the last little bit while he's been walking with Jesus to his house, remembering the first time he held his daughter, remembering the first time she walked to him, maybe dreaming about her possible future, that she might marry a man who's also a synagogue leader and he'd have a wonderful son-in-law, and, and suddenly all of that has disappeared. The daughter's dead. And yet Jesus is not in a hurry. He hasn't been concerned by the interruption. And I don't know about you, but just think about if you were in that situation. I think if I was Jesus, which is a good job I'm not, but if I was Jesus and I was on my way to the house of a very important person whose daughter was dying, I don't think I'd stop. Surely, there's nothing more important than getting there and accomplishing that task. I wouldn't have stopped. I wouldn't have allowed that woman to interrupt me. I would have ignored the touch, probably, which means I would have missed out on one of the greatest healings and greatest moments, I think, in, in the Gospels. And yet Jesus stopped. It seems like to Jesus, life had no interruptions. In fact, when we look at the gospel stories, very few of them are about his planned and formal teachings. They're more about his interruptions. I mean, in this story today, his interruption was interrupted because he wasn't on his way to Jairus's house, first of all. He was going somewhere else. But Jairus interrupted him, and then the lady interrupted that. His interruptions were interrupted, and yet Jesus seemed to always have time for them. He didn't ever seem to get bothered or angry at anyone interrupting him. So why weren't interruptions irritating to Jesus like they are to us? When we're on our way to do something, when we've got time pressure, when it's an urgent matter that has to be dealt with in a time sensitive moment, when we've got important people asking us to do things, it's irritating when we get interrupted. And yet Jesus didn't seem bothered. And I think it's to do with his priorities. Remember when Jesus was asked, what's the most important commandment? He was asked by the lawyer, what's the most important commandment? And Jesus says this. He says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love the Lord your God. Jesus defined love as the highest priority in the kingdom. And love is a quality of relationships. It's mission critical. It's what the thing that mattered most to Jesus were people, love, relationships. Comer in his book is really clear about the dangers of hurry and love. He says this on, on page 23, he says, hurry and love are incompatible. And even more strongly, he says, hurry kills relationships. So it turns out Phil Collins, no relation of mine, was right. You can't hurry love. Who knew? But on a serious note, it's interesting for me to be speaking about hurry and love when I'm here in Zambia, uh, from a place that feels like a second home to me, uh, a place that's taught me a lot about hurry and a lot about love. And it's taught me a lot about slowing down and putting people before task. I mean, there's just, in a warmer climate, you just can't rush around. In 30, almost 40 degree heat this week, you can't rush around, it's too hot. And it's, there's no air conditioning inside. And that's true for many hot climates, countries that are hot climates. You don't see people rushing around in the same way always, because it's just not physically possible. The sweat will drown you. <laughs> But there's something else here, aside from the climate. More than this, generally, if I'm walking somewhere to accomplish a task, maybe to go and speak to somebody, maybe to go and do something in town, if I meet someone along the way, then I will stop. 
and I'll greet them. I'll find out how they're doing, how their family are, and will allow for that interruption to happen because that's the culture here. I've observed it, I've seen it, I've received it on my part and I've learned to offer it out as well. Something I wouldn't maybe naturally do in England. But I stop and welcome the interruptions. And do you know what? Some of those moments have, have been some of my favourite times over the decade. Of chatting with people who I bumped into unexpectedly. Having those moments of connection. Trying to be present in the moment. No matter what the task is ahead of me that I need to accomplish. And that's not unique to here at all. Um, some people are naturally wired this way, which is a real gift. And uh, some people have reprioritized their lives to live that way. Um, I'm a big fan of Michelle Obama, and uh, I recently watched her documentary, Becoming, um, because I'd read her book of the same name. Highly recommend both of those things. But something really struck me in the documentary, and I think it was one of her assistants said that no matter at book signings and things like that, no matter how many people are in the line, no matter how big the pile of books she needs to sign, Michelle Obama doesn't look at the line of people or the pile of books. She looks at the person in front of her. She chooses to look them in the eye, say hello, find out their name, ask where they're from, and value the person right in front of her. She doesn't get distracted by the task. And I think that is such an incredible character trait, such an incredible choice to live that way, to prioritize people in that way. And obviously it makes me think of Jesus, that in the story today, people pressing in on him. And that happened all the time, crowds following him, people to teach, people to see, people to heal, the most important mission, most important task in all of history to accomplish. And yet we never once see him hurry or pressurized by people or time. And so Jesus offers us this radical countercultural invitation to an unhurried life, a life of rest, a full life, a life full of joy and peace and love. And he had the opportunity, he had the time to talk to people, to sleep, to eat meals, to welcome interruptions. And if there's anything we pick up from the stories of Jesus, it's that he wasn't in a hurry. He wasn't pressured by time or people. It wasn't the Jesus way. So what was the Jesus way? What is the Jesus way? Well, it's not like Jesus didn't do anything. He had a full life, um, just not over full. He wasn't overly busy that it became toxic in, in its hurriedness. And it meant he didn't have to cut out the things in front of him and the people in front of him and miss the moment. And he seemed to welcome these interruptions and not see them as an annoyance or a bother like we do. Like I said, he's so often interrupted that his interruptions got interrupted, like today. But also Jesus was an interrupter. As he, he kind of interrupted death of Jairus' daughter and brought her back to life. Interruptions in the kingdom of God don't stand in the way of the kingdom. It's about our priorities. You know, Jesus strikes me as so present in the moment, so present and so aware of heaven and earth in his body and around him. You know, think about one of his most famous sermons and he stops in the middle of it and goes, look at the birds in the air. He's so present. I don't know if you can hear the birds here, but just so present in the moment. Listen to the birds in the air, look at them. He just takes that moment of interruption from a bird. Another thing, Jesus, that was key to Jesus' way and Jesus' teaching and his way of life was this idea of the easy yoke, the life, the full life, a, a life of rest and abiding in him. And I think if we want to live the Jesus way and glorify him, I'm going to say I'm, I think that can only happen when we're well rested when we're happy, when we're at peace. I'm not sure we glorified Jesus or live the Jesus way when we're exhausted and tired. And that's a byproduct of hurry and pressure. Because Jesus 
At the center of his vision for the kingdom, for the culture of the kingdom, was this trio of love, joy, and peace. And Paul talks about it a lot. And they're not just emotions, they're the the inner disposition, the inner being of who we are, that we, we have love, joy, and peace in its fullness on the inside. And that we can be like Jesus, become like him, and do what he did. And I think about those three, love, joy, and peace. And a bit like Coma said, they're just not compatible with a hurried life. You think about love. I know I am at my worst, my most unloving moments as a church leader, as a friend, as a daughter, as a sister, as an auntie, when I'm in a hurry and when I feel pressured. And if my mum or dad are on the chat this morning, they could testify to that. They get the worst of me. I'm the most unloving when I'm stressed and under pressure and in a hurry. And I'm really sorry for that, mum and dad. But about joy? All the experts on happiness, whether they're Christian or, or not, seem to agree that there's a, the secret to a happy life is being present in the moment. Even if it's not a great moment. But how do I be present and not be thinking about all the things I've got to do and all the tasks ahead of me? How do we be present in this moment and take from it all that God is offering in this moment, interruptions and all? And then peace. I don't think anyone needs a lesson on this, but when was the last time that you were late for something important and you felt the deep shalom of Jesus? <laughs> when we're in a hurry, peace doesn't come naturally. So when John Altberg says, I cannot live in the kingdom of God with a hurried soul, that really resonates with me. Not I, not I should not, but I cannot. I cannot live in the kingdom of God with a hurried soul. And so here we are with this gift of lockdown. And I know it doesn't feel like a gift. I know it's tough. But for many of us, it means we're less busy. We have a chance to slow down and unhurry. And for those of us who are still busy, who still have a lot to accomplish, then we need to hear this too. We need to make sure we're prioritizing the kingdom, living the Jesus way, dealing with pressure and hurry the Jesus way. Rethink our priorities, rethink what we're valuing, rethink our time scales and our routines so that we can live the Jesus way. So I'm just gonna finish with some really practical ideas that John Mark Comer mentions and you can read about uh, much deeper in his book and on his website and all things like that. But four practices, spiritual disciplines, practices, routines, habits that can help us unhurry and take on the yoke of Jesus, the easy yoke that we might enter rest and have life in all its fullness of love, joy, and peace. So here we go. Number one, silence and solitude. And when I say silence and solitude, I don't mean lying on your bed, scrolling through Instagram on your own. That's not silence and solitude. That's just having a bit of me time, which is lovely, but this isn't what I'm talking about. Silence and solitude, time intentionally alone with God. Time to stop and be quiet, be still and listen to God. To allow the things that are making you anxious rise up and offer them to him. Find a time to, to do it, maybe every day. Jesus spent time in, in solitude with his father. The, other, the second thing we can do is, is Sabbath. And I think if we're honest, a lot of us haven't taken Sabbath seriously, I've always intended to, but I've never really made it a practice until this year. And so since September, I've actually put in my diary from 5 p.m. on a Friday to 5 p.m. on a Saturday is my Sabbath, my Shabbat. My time to stop, to rest, to delight, and to worship. My phone goes away for the majority of it, and I fill it with time with people I love, that bring me joy, people spend time with Jesus, be present with him, 
helped us to stop, rest, delight and worship. And since September I've been re it's in my diary, it's blocked out. And do you know what? I'm not sure I would have got through the last few months without having had those intentional Sabbath days. And so I want to encourage you um, to, to put that in your diary. If you're a busy person, even more so. Do you know what? I haven't been less productive. I haven't accomplished less. I haven't felt any more pressure. In fact, I think it's the opposite. And so I want to really encourage you to think about taking up the Sabbath as God intended. He designed us to have a day of rest. The third thing, simplicity. So the goal there is to, to not just declutter your wardrobe or your kitchen or your shed, which is great to declutter, but to declutter our lives, our hearts a little bit more, to center them on who and what really matters, Jesus and his way, his kingdom. It's an opportunity to de be defined by that. And two really easy ways to, to start to simplify life is to limit how much we own, to think about what we're buying. And the second thing to do is to practice generosity. And there's a freedom in that. And a key question when it comes to simplicity is, what would Jesus do if he were me? If he had my gender, my career, my house, lived in my neighborhood, what would he do? And it just helps simplify some of our decisions and how we spend our time and how we spend our money. So I'll leave that one with you. The fourth one, the last one is slowing. John Ortberg again, um, he said something great about slowing. He said, this is cultivating patience by deliberately choosing to place ourselves in positions where we simply have to wait. So remember back earlier when I was talking about the hurry sickness where we choose the shortest line and we try and get things done quicker. This is the opposite of that. And practicing this, intentionally doing, intentionally driving the speed limit. Yes, you. <laughs> intentionally driving the speed limit, intentionally going in the slow lane. Intentionally showing up 10 minutes early without our phones, just to stand there, just to sit there. Turning our smartphones into a dumb phone. I've done this, I've turned off all notifications on my phone. Um, I've, I've moved all the apps across so I can't access them. I've turned it a bit into a dumb phone. Um, or you can parent your phone. I love this idea, I hadn't come across it before. It's a parent your phone. So put your phone to bed before you go to bed. And don't let it wake you up, you go and wake it up in the morning. Parent your phone. Don't take it to bed with you. Um, keep your phone off or put it on Do Not Disturb. Again, another practice I've taken up. Uh, set times on social media. You can do that on your uh, time limits on your most smartphones. You can limit your time so you're not scrolling aimlessly. Set times for when you're gonna send emails. So a block of time, rather than constantly replying to the, the flow of email, set a time aside in the day to do that if you're at work. Walk slower. We're in lockdown. Where else have you got to be? Exercise isn't limited to an hour this time. So walk slower. Enjoy it. Be present in the moment. Cooking. That's something I've really enjoyed. I've always enjoyed cooking, but do you know what? When I've been on the go in the past and in a hurry and there's pressure to get somewhere and I'm between meetings, I just grab something and it's not really a joy to me. But by slowing down, I've really enjoyed that in this season of, of 2020. Cooking has become an activity rather than a pressure. I'm just slowing down and enjoying the process and then enjoying the flavors and the food. So if you're someone who just grabs food on the go, can I encourage you to start cooking and enjoying it a bit more? And there's so many more things we can do practically to slow down, to unhurry our lives and live life the Jesus way. So why don't we take a moment now to, to respond and as the band come back and lead us in worship. If any of this has resonated with you today, why not just take this moment to acknowledge that, to offer that to God and maybe say sorry. And say sorry, I'm so sorry that my priorities have been out of line with kingdom priorities, with the Jesus way. I'm so sorry I've put task and busyness as a priority and a status. Lord, forgive me. I want to live and learn how to live the Jesus way. Love being a priority. Would you help me? In Jesus' name. Amen. And maybe you want to commit to one of those practical things. Maybe... Um, you want to commit 
to silence and solitude and starting to practice that. Maybe you want to commit to the practice of having a Sabbath in the week. Maybe you want to commit to simplicity and starting there. Or maybe it's the, the slowing. Why don't you choose just one of those? We're on a long journey with Jesus. Choose one of those. Think about how to work that practically into your life so that we can take up this invitation from Jesus to be like him, to become, to be with him, to become more like him and to do what he would do. To not just hear his teachings, but to live in the way of him, the Jesus way. Because this is the invitation he offers us. And maybe you want to write this out and read it every morning to remember what you're invited into. The Jesus way of life, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light.